Good afternoon. I'm Rebecca Marquez, Business Intelligence Coordinator with PMMI, and I'd like to thank you for joining today's webinar on PMMI's Dairy Market Trends in Packaging and Processing Operations Report. Over the next hour, Nina Hallquist with Proactive Worldwide, Inc. will provide insight into the trends in dairy operations and the growing demand for new, flexible, versatile packaging and processing equipment. Nina Hallquist is a strategic marketing professional with more than 15 years of experience conducting research and leading teams in global market studies, competitive analysis, strategy development, business planning, and implementation. She leads research projects for Proactive Worldwide, a strategy consulting and decision support firm that serves multinational corporations across several industries, including consumer goods and industrial manufacturing. Today's discussion will focus on the global dairy market growth, dairy product and packaging trends, original equipment manufacturer or OEM packaging and project involvement, packaging equipment investment timeframe, equipment demand and specifications, equipment automation drivers, and potential equipment provider solutions. At the end of the presentation, which will last approximately 45 to 50 minutes, Nina will answer any questions you may have. At this point, I would like to hand the webinar over to Nina Hallquist with Proactive Worldwide. So much, Rebecca. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks very much for your attendance today. And uh, so I'm here to talk about uh, trends in dairy packaging and processing operations. And this is actually um, a recap of a 2013 market study uh, that uh, uh, PMMI did. And so throughout this study, we really focused on um, looking at global market size and structure and trends for the dairy industry and also the drivers affecting it as well, marketing and distribution, consumer trends, and emerging trends as well. And then uh, looked at how that affected the processing and packaging supply chain uh, for the industry as well, for both primary and secondary packaging. And then we also um, we interviewed a number of different um, uh, industry segments, including uh, CPG and food suppliers, to get really an unbiased and kind of objective understanding of um, the decision makers within the dairy industry at those companies and the implications for investment. Um, we looked at regulatory issues affecting dairy industry and packaging. And uh, we also uh, evaluated um, if there will be an increase or decrease in the amount of packaging and processing machinery purchased in the industry. So those were kind of the main topics that we covered here. So I'll talk a little bit about um, the study methodology that we used uh, to conduct the study, and then I'll get into the topics that uh, Rebecca just went over here. So in terms of methodology, we had 75 respondents uh, to our study. Majority of them were in the North America, um, primarily from the US, although we did have one from Canada and one from Mexico and North America. And then the remaining 23% were really spread across um, uh, the EMEA region, um, Australia and New Zealand, and also Latin, and Latin America as well. As far as industry segments, uh, food suppliers and producers made the, uh, the largest portion of respondents. And so um, there we have you know, the real decision makers in terms of packaging. Also, we got the point of view of the machine equipment providers, uh, CPG firms, and uh, package material suppliers as well. So, so those were the, uh, the segments that we covered. And then as far as the specific role of the respondents, um, it ranged from project engineering to design uh, to sales and marketing as well. Um, a lot of folks um, focusing on operations. That was, that was the largest segment, followed by packaging engineering. So when we look at the global dairy market, uh, what are we seeing growth-wise? Um, well, the, uh, in terms of milk production, and we looked at that as kind of one of the, uh, the main metrics for growth, we're seeing slow growth there uh, among the major exporters. And you can see there the, the graph from uh, the USDA uh, for global milk 
uh, production on that one. But um, there definitely are opportunities in particular segments that are definitely growing. And uh, uh, cheese and yogurt in particular were a couple of areas that we were hearing as, uh, as we did our study that were growing. Um, certainly for cheese, the, the number of varieties of cheese that people are um, demanding as palates change and become more sophisticated. And also uh, yogurt just continues its, its strong growth um, that has, uh, has taken place over the last several years. That is continuing. So there are definitely areas of growth within uh, the dairy market. There are also um, opportunities that we identified, um, particularly in um, emerging markets, uh, if you know, processors are willing to take this on and export, um, you know, really growth markets in, in China and India that we're seeing, and also um, key consumer trends. Uh, if processors can de definitely tailor their business practices to meet shopper needs. And there, when we were looking at m millennials um, gaining buying power, um, you know, their consumer preferences continuing to shift and, um, you know, really wanting things like on-the-go portions and choice and make, being able to personalize things. Also, uh, choosing organic and natural options. We're seeing those trends there, so being, being able to meet those needs. And then thirdly, um, you know, opportunities around operational efficiency. So, you know, throughout the whole supply chain, uh, managing costs, um, network optimization, et cetera, and really maximizing supply chain and logistics. And um, w one area in particular that we're going to focus on a little later here is how, how um, you can improve uh, operational efficiency through automation and um, automation of packaging. And so that was uh, one topic that um, respondents did, did uh, give us some color commentary on, so we'll be talking about that. In terms of dairy product trends, um, as I mentioned, we're really seeing the demand for natural products, organic products, artisanal products with fewer additives. Um, all of these things are um, really definitely trends that we're seeing. Uh, consumers want more transparency about the product's provenance, where it originated. And, uh, so, and this is leading to some changes in um, uh, dairy product recipes, uh, fewer additives and also processing and packaging. Uh, one example of that is um, uh, growing popularity of processes such as filtration to increase shelf life. So if you use more natural products and fewer additives, then you have to find other, way, other ways to, uh, to increase shelf life. Filtration uh, is one of them as well. And so specific trends uh, that we're seeing is milk seen as a health food. So um, fortified milks, flavored milks, drinkable yogurts and things, um, really marketed as, as you know, things that are healthy for you and um, packing nutrients. Also, um, as I mentioned, those kind of on-the-go portion-controlled dairy snacks um, and even targeted at different times of day. So, so a mid-morning snack of drinkable yogurt, for example. Um, so that was a trend that we were seeing. Continuing popularity of yogurt, and this is, you know, back, back to the 2013 study, yogurt was mentioned as a fast-growing dairy product. It still is uh, today and continues to grow. And uh, more fl flavor variety in cheese, we talked about that, and more flavors in different types of cheese. Um, one uh, respondent talked about, you know, five different types of Manchego cheese that, uh, that they're seeing in, in stores now. So um, definitely more variety there. And also um, the reemergence of butter and fat-rich dairy. And this is this is more recent. Um, attitudes are changing a little bit um, as uh, folks learn a little bit more about the types of fat um, and properties of dairy fat that uh, that, that are health, actually viewed as healthy now and not associated with uh, chronic disease. And so um, we're seeing some of those products regaining market share. And that's a little bit of a difference uh, from the flashback to the 2013 study that you can see there. Um, folks were still talking about low-fat or fat-free products. Um, but, so a little bit of a, a change there, but um, so otherwise pretty consistent with um, yogurt being a, a, still a popular product, organics being um, definitely popular, and uh, fortified products as well. One other thing I wanted to mention here um, is that some, some of what's driving this is um, the requirements for GMO labeling in the U.S. 
And uh, there, so that that's even reinforcing this demand for more kind of organic products. Also, more transparency on food labeling as well in general. Uh, so that's uh, that's another kind of driver here also. And then how does this flow through to dairy packaging trends? Well, they are reflecting the demand for more natural and organic, and organic dairy products. And so one, um, one consequence of this is that um, uh, basically CPG firms and food suppliers are looking for more shelf-stable packaging because, again, this is a way to preserve products that have more natural ingredients in them, fewer additives, and keep them um, as, you know, as uh, fresh as possible while being as natural as possible. And uh, one, one thing that we were seeing among respondents was the demand for uh, aseptic packaging uh, is particularly strong. And they also specifically mentioned um, things like modified atmosphere packaging as a shelf-stable uh, packaging alternative. Um, Tetra Pak was mentioned. Uh, that's more um, popular in EMEA and developing markets, but it was certainly mentioned as an option. Also, um, biodegradable and transparent packaging. Uh, so this is kind of to complement the organic dairy food trend and comply with environmental regulations, particularly in EMEA. They are, they're um, more stringent on, uh, on biodegradable packaging there. So uh, that was a driver for them. And consumers themselves are also um, asking for more transparent, clear, see-through packaging. Again, going, going back to the whole uh, transparency trend there and knowing what, what goes into your food. Um, one thing that was mentioned also was um, recyclable improvements in packaging as an innovation disruptor. So um, equipment improvements for recyclable high-density uh, polyethylene bottles uh, was, was one example that was given by respondents as uh, kind of an innovation disruptor there. And then thirdly, um, a, a key packaging trend is flexible and retail-ready packaging. And this is really being driven by the big box retailers. Uh, they want flexible packaging. They want retail ready, and uh, that meaning ready to display. And so, um, a couple of examples of that are display ready corrugated cases and secondary packaging packaging that is easy to remove, but things that can be immediately put on the shelf so they don't have to be hung or have kind of uh, secondary steps taken that they're immediately ready for real retail display. And then a flashback to um, the, the 2013 study, um, some kind of enduring packaging trends. We did see some overlap, so shelf-stable, again. Um, so Single-servant on the goat packs, we were hearing about those individual servings also and sustainability. Um, labeling concerns, so that was, uh, that was a concern then as well, and it continues to be now, especially with the, uh, the legislation that has um, gone through and uh, is now law and flexible packaging, growing use of stand-up pouches, that all of those things continue to be uh, trends that we're seeing. Okay. So um, in terms of regional packaging, dairy packaging trends, um, we were looking at you know, what type of packaging is more popular region by region. And so what we were seeing is that rigid plastic is the most popular dairy packaging product pretty much in everywhere, uh, except for Asia Pacific where liquid cartons are uh, most popular. And uh, so they definitely account for the highest share of overall packaging uh, in Western Europe and North America also. And they account for a significant units, uh, number of units in Asia Pacific as well, obviously with a large population there, uh, even though it's the second uh, most popular pa packaging product behind liquid cartons, um, still a lar large number of units demanded there. Flexible packaging is also uh, another packaging type that's popular in Asia Pacific and Eastern Europe and Latin America. Um, but uh, liquid cartons are kind of the most, second most popular in, uh, in Western Europe and um, also Latin America. In terms of original equipment manufacturer project involvement, um, so here we were asking about respondents, particularly from um, 
you know, the CPG firms, the food suppliers, you know, when do you want um, packaging OEMs to be involved in your projects? Um, when do you feel that they provide value? And um, they said particularly for uh, as our needs become more complex, as we want and demand more flexible and versatile types of packaging, we want machines that can accommodate that, uh, that can be uh, reconfigured to produce multiple types of packaging. As a result, we want to, for those types of projects that are more complex, we want to bring OEMs in earlier, and we do, uh, to advise on what's possible with packaging design. So they're, they're part of the you know, design and analysis process, and they want them to be a collaborate, collaborative advisor uh, on those machines. And the machine equipment providers we talk to themselves um, also want to be seen as a collaborative advisor, certainly then, rather than just uh, competing on price. Um, because they, they really want to be able to make suggestions on things like production techniques and the, you know, things that they see will be able to result in a lower total cost of ownership and higher ROI for, uh, for their customers. So they definitely want to be involved there. Um, one thing that they said was if we are reduced to compete on price, then it becomes, it becomes very difficult to differentiate yourself. So really we want to be, you know, we, we aim to be involved earlier so that um, we can set ourselves apart and really provide value to our customers. In terms of equipment investment uh, drivers there, um, you know, clearly ROI is one of them, but um, some others that uh, folks mentioned were, again, improvements in machine flexibility, speed, um, versatility, being able to produce different types of packaging using one machine. That was a consistent theme. Um, also, uh, greater automation uh, to increase efficiency. So, um, and, and there are different types of automation that people talked about and ways to automate. Um, we'll talk about that in a, a couple slides here. And then thirdly, solutions to specific pain points. And uh, here folks talked about uh, the Food Safety and Modernization Act and all the documentation requirements that go along with that as something that um, they were looking for, you know, as they invest in equipment and they have to do documentation, they're looking for monitoring uh, capabilities, track and trace capabilities uh, that will really help them uh, comply with all the documentation that they have to produce for this so that, um, that it will support those efforts. In terms of equipment investment timeframes, um, the CPG firms and food suppliers we spoke to um, invest in food packaging equipment annually, but that's a little bit misleading because um, they're typically investing just to replace worn out equipment, not all of their equipment, of course. And so um, that means that you know, it could be different annual cycles for different types of equipment. Um, so, and they said that you know, new packaging equipment projects don't occur every year. So you know, the equipment timeframes can vary considerably. And they, say, they said that um, their packaging equipment typically has a 10-year life cycle. So um, it, it, there's not a very regular uh, cycle with investment, although you know, they do invest annually, but it could be for different types of equipment each year. Uh, and then obviously with the, the equipment life cycle, uh, investment timeframes can vary. They also talked about um, retrofits. Uh, and they said that retrofits were often easier to justify as an investment so retrofitting an existing piece of equipment uh, rather than purchasing uh, a new machine. So that was something that, you know, when they were making arguments to their management about what kind of equipment uh, their equipment needs and, uh, and new equipment they needed, retrofits were a little bit of an easier case to make than new packaging equipment. So um, that was, was identified as a challenge. But one thing they said uh, that they, they thought would be a differentiator, and this is, again, the CPG firms and food suppliers that we talked to when, when thinking about packaging equipment providers, um, a differentiator would be um, an OEM designing a versatile machine to convert for multiple package types. So this was definitely identified as something that um, would, uh, would be you know, unique and add value um, that they're not seeing as much. Uh, so that's an opportunity for uh, packaging equipment providers.
in terms of equipment demand and specifications. So here again, we're seeing that, that shelf-stable packaging, um, specific types mentioned were aseptic, uh, Tetra Pak again, although again, that was, that was more focused for the MEA respondents, uh, and modified atmosphere packaging and being in greater demand, um, again, because of natural product trends. They also mentioned uh, vacuum packaging also. Um, and also uh, flexible packaging, being able to make uh, flexible pouches, gussets, uh, things like that. Um, equipment to make secondary packaging that is shelf ready. Uh, one example that they gave was perforated secondary packaging, uh, for example. So uh, basically uh, packaging that is flexible and retail ready. And then um, conversion equipment to enable packaging machines to produce mul multiple types of packaging, as we mentioned previously. And then in terms of, um, so we see packaging trends driving packaging equipment demand. We're also seeing regulatory requirements driving equipment design and specs. Uh, so one big trend here was um, hy hygienic design and really driven by uh, regulatory requirements that have increased the demand for hygienically designed packaging equipment, equipment that's easy to clean, uh, withstands being wet from the cleaning process, um, particularly um, the, one specific thing they mentioned was switches uh, that must be, they called it IP6778. Uh, was one spec they mentioned, and also being able to withstand high pressure water from the cleaning process. Uh, that was a requirement. Also, uh, stainless steel was something that was mentioned consistently, and specifically uh, stainless steel 316 uh, for equipment, screws, bolts, uh, all of those things that come into contact with dairy. But also, um, several respondents said that they would prefer stainless steel, even for machine parts that do not contact dairy products, just so that they ensure they're compliant and uh, prevent any high-profile contamination. So um, and regulatory requirements certainly are driving that. Um, and uh, so they, they said that those, even if um, the, uh, that equipment wasn't touching dairy products, they still want it to be stainless steel to ensure hygiene. Equipment capabilities um, that were in highest demand there were um, flexibility, so again, producing multiple packages and size and types of capability to do that, um, to produce packaging quickly uh, with shorter production runs, and being able to change over easily. That was another theme that was definitely highlighted. Um, being easy to clean uh, and uh, being hygienically designed, enabling clean in place, for example. Um, to comply with regulatory requirements was in high demand, and then automation. And specifically, they talked about uh, robotics uh, to execute repetitive tasks. So that would be a way to increase um, operational efficiency there. Specific equipment that a respondent, respondents mentioned most often as being in highest demand. Um, were the case packers and case form packaging, fillers, flow wrappers, and high-speed uh, horizontal film seal. Um, they also talked about um, using total productive maintenance procedures and single-minute exchange of dyes um, as capabilities there. So really the themes here are kind of regulatory requirements and packaging trends driving that demand. And we mentioned automation a few times here. So when we ask specifically about you know, what's really driving um, automation capabilities for dairy packaging equipment, um, really it was all about achieving greater production and cost efficiency. And this was in particular in developed markets where labor costs are higher. So that was mentioned most often in uh, North America and Western Europe. Also, um, with the growing use of big data and intelligent machines, um, that, that is enabling track and trace uh, capabilities and also enabling accurate uh, documentation. So 
um, one, one responded in particular talked about FISMA rules and how he has to document every single step of his production process and how you know, difficult that will be. And so if he can have any way uh, that automated machines can help him do that, that would absolutely be a differentiator for him. In terms of challenge, uh, automation challenges, and this is where um, you know, the difficulties with using automated machines will require greater support um, from package equipment providers. So you know, automated equipment definitely in increases efficiency, but um, it does tend to break down and take longer to di diagnose and fix uh, because it's more complex. So they, they need greater support in doing that. And it requires greater te technical ability to operate. So um, getting more training on that to, to be able to operate it and maintain it effectively is another um, area of support that they're looking for from OEMs. As far as specific things that um, they, are, they have been looking to automate, a couple of examples were things like automated bag handling, uh, filling, and palletizing as well. Those were examples of kind of automated procedures. So in terms of kind of the ask for OEMs here, again, we're um, you know, training on the automated equipment, providing good aftermarket support so if there is a problem, uh, they can get in touch with the manufacturer to understand how to resolve it. And also, um, thirdly, they talked about incorporating analytic capabilities into um, automated dairy packaging machines. And um, specific areas they talked about there were monitoring equipment and performance, uh, production metrics, and um, uh, specific production metrics they talked about were things like runtime and downtime, uh, line feeds, batch sizes, um, overall asset utilization, and improving um, change over time. So that, those were several kind of specific um, metrics that they were talking about when they talked about analytics for um, production there. They also talked about um, using analytics to help troubleshoot and diagnose the, pro um, the cause of production problems. And then um, track and trace capabilities as well to help them comply with regulatory requirements again. And then a few other analytics uh, metrics that they talked about were um, those for production, so things like the number of cartons and liters per hour, um, and also tr um, troubleshooting as well. And um, interestingly, you know, a couple of respondents we talked to, uh, an export manager and, uh, specifically for an equipment provider, said that, you know what, not all dairies are asking for this yet, but as regulatory requirements become more stringent, there, more and more of them are starting to. Um, so he's, he saw this definitely as a trend um, that he was seeing in terms of what's demanded for, um, for equipment. So given what we've talked about in terms of what's being demanded as far as dairy products and then what that means uh, for packaging and uh, what equipment providers can do, here are some kind of challenges and then some potential solutions that we saw as we were doing this study. So um, food companies' are, expenses are increasing, and um, that's due to some vertical integration into the industry. And one example of this is that, uh, that we were hearing about a few times from a, a few respondents is that um, companies like uh, CPG firms like Walmart are getting into dairy processing. And so they're, um, they're, fa they're even facing competition from former customers. Um, so that's uh, causing um, greater competition, more um, price pressure. And then they're also, on the flip side, they're seeing uh, ex increasing expenses due to the fact that more organic and natural dairy products are being required. So they're having to change the way they're packaging. That increases expenses. Um, so given these two kind of two uh, pressures that they're feeling, um, what can equipment providers do to provide some solutions? And so a few things that we thought of were collaborating uh, with um, dairy customers to kind of learn more about their business, 
uh, work with them to develop business processes uh, that integrate uh, better with the processing and pa packaging equipment so that um, the equipment itself works well with the dairy customers' business processes that are already established. So that just makes everything more efficient, less labor in uh, intensive, and more cost effective. Another option we thought of is um, basically listing price, um, options on a price menu so that uh, the customers can tailor the packaging to their needs with cost in mind. So you know, as they're facing, facing increased expenses in the rest of their business, they can really tailor um, the packaging equipment to, to what they need and their budget. We also thought of perhaps developing an auditing program. Um, and so there, the machine OEM could come in and review the machine performance um, and provide a lifetime, lifetime cycle runtime estimate there to see if the machine is really you know, running the way it should be, um, still has the same product life cycle that it originally was supposed to have, or should it be replaced sooner. This is basically a way to kind of track your installed base uh, to see where opportunities may come up. But it's also a way to kind of reestablish and reinforce uh, your relationship with your customers as well. Another challenge we're seeing for uh, food companies is that demand for uh, shelf-stable and hygienic packaging for dairy. And so you know, uh, packaging that improves the shelf life of dairy, natural dairy products. And so a couple of solutions we thought of there were designing a packaging machines for obviously shelf-stable packaging that's hygienic, extending dairy product shelf life. Uh, so that's definitely a trend that we heard over and over. You could also uh, partner with a firm that specializes in um, cleaning solutions uh, to provide cleaning solutions and consulting on um, dairy packaging equipment machines. Um, so they're just fulfilling that demand for um, hygiene and uh, clean in place as well. Some other challenges we, we identified um, through this study, so we've talked about increasing regulatory restrictions. And so you know, rules are becoming more, more complex, um, certainly in the US with FISMA. And um, those, those types of rules have already existed in, in the EMEA for some time and, so, um, and can continue to become more stringent. So in order to respond to this, um, some solutions you could provide our um, manufacturing dairy equipment uh, packaging machines, again, with stainless steel and electrical switches. Um, those were two things that uh, respondents mentioned most often that they, uh, would look to, that they would look to require in dairy packaging equipment. Um, producing machines with automated production monitoring, as we talked about. And then um, another uh, thing that was mentioned was producing machines that can add QR codes to packaging. Uh, this is just another way to provide those track and trace capabilities as well. Another challenge uh, that food companies talked about was you know, flexibility in equipment, equipment that can be easily modified to different material types or sizes that enable changeovers quickly. Uh, that was another uh, trend. and so. A solution could be designing machines that can accommodate multiple package materials, thicknesses, types, um, and conversion equipment, so enabling those changeovers. Another solution could be um, designing more machines with more integrated lines uh, to keep products under control, and basically using, uh, enabling the use of more packaging materials, shorter runs, uh, shorter runs were definitely mentioned, um, and then more customization. And finally, um, they had difficult, uh, difficulties operating automated machines like we talked about. Um, so providing that training, ongoing technical support to operators, um, and providing that training up front to make sure that they're well versed in uh, uh, their automated equipment. Um, adding analytic features uh, to help operators diagnose machine issues as well as tracking you know, production metrics, so those two things. And then one thing that uh, we heard from respondents as well was um, 
uh, it was kind of a unique solution, adding augmented reality visual tools uh, to help operators troubleshoot problems. And one example that was given uh, for this was that um, Diversity Care has um, an augmented reality iPad up that overlays um, the control panel of a dishwasher so that restaurants can troubleshoot what's wrong with their machines and attempt fixes. And so this is you know, obviously not a direct comparison, but it's just an example of what could be possible to help operators troubleshoot on their own rather than having to call um, the equipment manufacturer and get support from them. So uh, just another way to uh, enable them to kind of fix it on their own if they can. So that takes us through the executive summary findings of um, our report, and obviously we have the full report available to you. Um, but uh, any questions at this time? Janina, thank you for your insight on the Dairy Market Trends in Packaging and Processing Operations Report and how it's going to affect the packaging and processing industry. Um, I would also like to open up the session up uh, to questions. Please enter any questions that you would like to have answered in the message or chat box, and we can have those addressed. Okay, Nina, I do have one question. Sure. Um, in terms of monitoring and analytics, mm -hmm. um, in any of your interviews, did you find any mentions of remote access capabilities that would be requested or communicated to OEMs? You know, we didn't hear about remote access capabilities. It's more around um, the specifics are around you know, some production metrics. Um, uh, and also the, the helping with documentation monitoring. But I will tell you that um, in our work with um, other uh, machine providers, certainly um, remote access is something that they are working on and enabling in their machines as people, you know, more and more are out of the office or you know, at another site um, or, or just geographically dispersed in terms of operations. It's certainly something that we're seeing overall. Um, they didn't mention it specifically here very much, but uh, it's certainly an overall trend. OK, great. And uh, if anyone does have any questions, you can feel free to answer them in the question chat box, and I'll make sure that that gets addressed. I do have one other question so far. Um, is there anything that you uncovered in your interviews that might be perceived as an obstacle to innovation um, on equipment design? Mm. I think one thing that was, um, that was difficult for equipment providers was just the lack of consistency in investment timeframes. And so you know, they, they cited that as a challenge because, of course, the, you know, the business flow then is not consistent. So it's, uh, that makes it a little bit more difficult to invest in machine equipment innovation and trying new things. Um, so that was one thing that was, uh, was difficult. But they know um, the key trends that they need to go after. They do know that you know, automation and analytics is something that people are looking for, and versatility is something pe people are looking for. Um, so they're, they're certainly looking to invest in that, but just having that kind of consistent um, revenue flow and cash flow is, you know, was, a, was a challenge. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. One thing I should mention that I forgot to actually at the beginning here in terms of um, dairy market trends. Um, in terms of the structure of the industry, we had been seeing some consolidation with um, large uh, CPG firms, um, you know, kind of snapping up smaller ones. And I think uh, one uh, example that we heard um, was like Lactalis buying Parmalat and Galbani uh, was one example, but there were several others. Um, but they said that, um, our respondents said that really their perception was that this kind of consolidation trend is slowing, slowing down a little bit now. Um, and uh, 
um, so the implications being that um, you know industry stabilizing a little bit, but then they also identified a disruptor as that vertical integration that I was talking about with Walmart and others like Kroger is getting into dairy uh, processing as well. So they're starting to see some of their big customers starting to compete with them too. So um, so just a couple of trends there. Okay. And if there's any other questions, please feel free to add them into the um, question chat chat box. I do see a couple. Um, one is from Jorge. Uh, do you see any specific opportunities on dairy segments um, and yogurt cheese that he put in there? Um, so yogurt is definitely uh, still growing. And um, companies are even collaborating with uh, like package designers, like artists, uh, to try and differentiate their yogurt products, uh, YoPlay in particular, and we have an example in the report is is doing that just to try because there's so you know it's obviously a growth trend so there are a lot there's a lot of competition and so they're trying to figure out different ways to compete. One of them is um, working with artists. Another is trying to figure out uh, different package designs like having the spoon in the lid, uh, for example. And so um, they're they're trying different ways to to compete in that market. Um, it's growing but it's competitive. Um, Cheese as well is another growing segment, and uh, there they were talking about individual servings of cheese and different kinds of um, more sophisticated cheese as particular opportunities there. So uh, Manchego, um, Brie, things like that. Um, but uh, so those were the specific things they mentioned there. Okay, great. And I do see another question here. Um, are these dairies interested in standardizing across their divisions? Do they have engineering located at one location and then have a different re and then have different regional needs? Mm -hmm. There, um, we didn't get a you know specific feedback on that. Um, we did see some differentiation in packaging needs across different regions. Uh, so like for in North America, for example, people really emphasizing that they were very concerned about having to comply with FISMA and, uh, and also the new GMO uh, labeling regulations coming in. And so um, they were you know, concerned about how to deal with that. Um, they were also, and I mean, they were also concerned with more environmental packaging as well. So that, that, was, that was mentioned more often as a need. We need to pre have biodegradable packaging because it's a re you know, regulatory requirement here. Um, so that was a little bit of a difference there. Um, they didn't mention um, standardization across uh, divisions. We, we talked to a, a lot of different types of firms. So we talked to large CPG firms. We talked to uh, you know, smaller dairy farms and then uh, food suppliers in between those two extremes. Um, they didn't talk about um, uh, standardizing across their divisions so much, um, but that certainly could be a possibility. Okay, great. Well, Nina, I, um, I, I, I think that's it for the questions right now. Um, so I think we can conclude here. Uh, on behalf of PMMI, thank you so much for participating in today's webinar. Um, as a final note, for everyone who attended, you'll be receiving an email with an evaluation for today's webinar. Um, please take a moment to complete the evaluation and let us know how we can improve this presentations like this. And thank you very much, and thank you so much, Nina, for helping us out today. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. All right. Thank you.